Hey, this is O'Teal. If you're liking what you're hearing, head on over to patreon.com forward slash comes a time pod and get your bus pass for an extra episode every week. Comes a time. Another one. This is Mike. This is O'Teal. We keep saying it every time we have another. We're like, wow, I think that was the best one no, yet. <laughs> I'm going on record. I'm going on record. This was the most, uh, this was my favorite episode of any podcast ever recorded in the history of podcasts. <laughs> I don't. My dear, dear friend, Victor Wooten. Uh, it's a good timing because he has a new book out called The Spirit of Music, a follow up to his last book. And, uh, you know, I've known Vic since I was 19, and it just like it never gets old, man. It's something. There, there were, I, there were, first of all, I just want to say that you have um, graced uh, me and the listeners with a lot of amazing people to, to talk to and listen to. And as a fan of most or all of these people, a lot of times I'm like, how lucky am I to get to do this podcast, you know, with you? And to learn from these amazing people, uh, this one was something, man, like from the start. Um, and I've been, I, I had no idea what it was, was going to be like to get to talk to Victor. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know. Yeah. I kind of had an idea about other people, but I had, didn't know. And I didn't yeah. know if it was just going to be nerding out about bass. And I was just going to kind of be like listening. <laughs> Dude, I felt like I went to church five times in the past two hours. <laughs> He's an unbelievable human being, man. Yeah, for us, uh, you know, it was never just about music, you know. Um, he is. It's it's about uh, being human, which is why I think we ran into the people that we did. We're blessed with the people that we had in our lives to begin with. Like he talks about our parents, how lucky we are, our older brothers, how incredibly lucky we are and we benefited so much. And then, you know, now at 56, we're the same age. We're like a month apart. Um, his, he's born on September 11th, September 11th. Wow. So, you know, it's a day of extremism. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, it totally fits with him, him and Mickey Hart have the same birthday. No kidding. I didn't know. Yeah. That wow. They share wow. a birthday. If you look back on my Instagram, um, but yeah, he's always, and, and his brothers too, man, you know, it's the, the kind of people that they are is why their music is so deep, you yeah. know? And, uh, I, I love that we get to meet that person. Those who are fans that have read his, his first book, Spirit of Music, or have ever taken one of his camps, you know, you know this well. Mm. Uh, but Those I'm students. glad you got to have that because that's like, for him, this is a thing that goes back so far for me uh, that you're like, oh, God, I wish my brother was alive. But you get to see that, you know, with Vic being on here, you get to see a little bit of that. And we, sh we need to have the other ones. We need to have Reggie on, man. Let's do it, man. And, Let's uh, do it. Reggie's taught, Reggie's the teacher of the family. And now Vic, you know, he says, yeah, I, I get the credit for being such a great teacher and all this stuff. He's like, but, you know, I steal all this stuff from my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome, man. That's just so incredible. The, th yeah. the way that he is so, uh, like, it, he's reassuring. He's reassuring that it's a, like, like no, you're all right. Like, you're doing the, the like, when he, I don't want to give too much away, but when he talks about how his brother would teach and, like, not, yeah. you know, you're not, you're not doing it wrong. Like, God damn it. That, that would change. He, when you guys were talking about certain moments, I was thinking about, you know, part, you know, putting it into my life and my experiences. And I'm like, the, the way that people treat each other is so pivotal. It really is. The intention behind mm -hmm. what you do is so pivotal. Everyone that's listening, like just real, like take a beat before you answer or like put mm -hmm. yourself in other people's shoes or talk like, man, so many unbelievable messages just in like the, the like just coming off of him. Like a, he's like an Oracle. That was really unbelievable, man. That was really yeah. great. This one, it was this church one is for very sure. special. So thank you everybody for listening. And, uh, you know, 
uh, you're going to love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, if you have half a heart, you're yeah, going to really if you don't, enjoy Yeah, this. if you don't like this one, then I think there's some <laughs> other podcasts for you. But uh, come <laughs> check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash comes a time pod, where we got a whole bunch of great bonus content, um, book lists, wormholes, you name it. And we're here on Osiris, home to so many unbelievable podcasts, so check all them out. By the way, Oteil, amazing mushrooms. They were breathing the whole time. You know, anyway, uh, it was Peter Erskine that turned me on to this thing. And I'm like, you know what? You know, I'm used to a, being on a big stage, but now my stage is like a three inch square on yeah. somebody's computer. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so, it's so weird. I was telling Otil, like I, I do stand up comedy and I have a show coming up where I have to tell jokes to like as many tiles that bought tickets. Right. You know what I mean? And it's so straight. <laughs> like I can't, right. he's seen me do, do shows and it's like, I read off the crowd. I talk to the crowd. I try to do, so it's definitely, is all of this new to you? Like, were you into like the, the, you know, digital side of it, like the vid visual digital side of it prior well, to Well, no, I wasn't. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I would do Skype with people, FaceTime. Um, and, you know, when, once we found out, I, I do some teaching at, at Berkeley in, in Boston every month. I, I'm up there. But once we found out we were going virtual, um, the chair of the base department is my longtime friend, Steve Bailey, who's as smart as they come. As soon as he found out we were going virtual, he he reached out to one of his donors who, who had donated money uh, for a certain thing for the base department. He asked him, could he use that money to get interfaces for his staff and i think there's 20 instruct base instructors so all of a sudden in the mail comes this this mixer which is called just a simple alesis multi-mix pro it's just a wow. four multi-mix four pro uh -huh. and it's yeah. just a not not as like a hundred dollars but plug and play four channels with alesis reverbs and stuff but the coolest thing about it is that it showed up in the mail for each of us teachers with a microphone, a stand, uh, uh, something else I can't remember, but everything we needed to go online. And then we got an email at our Berkeley email says you have an appointment, you know, and, and in groups of four and five, we all learn how to work it together. And so when we actually had to teach online, we were ahead of the game. That's incredible. Yeah, it was really, really cool. So that's what really got me into it. And I researched Zoom and I found out Zoom allows you to have three cameras anyway. Most people don't know it, but a Zoom allows you to have three cameras. Now it allows four with the update. Ah, so with wow. a shortcut, you can switch cameras. It's not as clean as this unit Peter Erskine turned us on to, but you can still have different views. And if I'm going to be online in front of people who are used to seeing me on stage, I understand, we all understand the importance of appearance on stage. Not that I got to, you know, dress all crazy, but you know, we got to move They people look, some people listen with their eyes. Yeah. And now that all people get is a, a torso, you know, and, and if they're on a laptop, you get it's like maybe two inches of a torso. And I still want to be at the top of the game, you know, and, and, and if I, especially if I want to get hired for something, I don't want to be normal. I don't want to be regular. I want to be able to have this view. But if I pick up my base, I want to be able to go here. Man, you know, and if I want you to see something over here, I want you, you know, I, I want I <laughs> want to crazy. just be able to freak you out. You know, if I want to <laughs> go to my whiteboard, I can stand up and go over here Jesus. and write on my whiteboard, you know, 
um, if, if I, for fun, you know, I can show you the, from the rear of the studio. Now I'm way up here. You know? it, wow. And again, if I want to share my screen, it, it's at a push of a button. And, and yes, I can, you know, I can, I can show up in, in the, uh, whatever you call it, uh, picture in picture if I want, you know? So anyway, and, uh, I, I don't, I don't think I would expect any less. <laughs> <from you. laughs> yeah. But you know, it, it, for me, it's the same as you go to a concert and they have lights yeah. And they, you know, they have, they may have a set, they may have whatever, you know, you up right. the presentation. So <laughs> it is true. It was, I got to thank Peter Erskine though, because when he turned me on to it, he turned Steve Bailey and me, he gave us a private, you know, meeting and I was like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Yeah. I got to thank Peter Erskine for just having a career in music since that night that I saw him at Constitution Hall yeah, in D.C. when I was like 17 or something, 16 or 17. And that night I was like, I think this is what I want to do, you know? Yeah. It's just like... Didn't you say that was one of your first concerts, right? My very first one was Brothers Johnson with the emotions. Remember when they had oh. Strawberry Letter 23 out of it? Uh, that was... Uh. <laughs> um, Wow. That was the first one. That was the first time I smelled weed. I didn't know what it was. I was like, Kofi, is it the Capitol Center? I was like, what's that? The whole, sm the whole Capitol S Center smells like something. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like that I had no like idea something. what it was. So he just laughed. <laughs> oh, wow. it was so funny, man. But yeah, I, that, I was one of the few concerts that I went to see younger mm. with the weather report i'm glad i got to see him a few times back then erskine oh god yeah you know you know the interplay weather report back then it was just like freaking yeah. it was ridiculous oh that was with jocko yeah jocko robert thomas jr erskine mm, wayne Jesus. joe i never got to see jocko i saw him like I think three times. I think I saw him at Wolf Trap, uh, oh. Meriwether Post, and I Constitution Hall, and I believe even once at Blues Alley later on mm -hmm. with Mike Stern and Kim with Denard. Yeah, I never got to see Stanley. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I got to see that. <laughs> my brothers went to see Weather Report with Jocko. By the time I got to see Weather Report, it was Victor Bailey's first tour. Yeah, with Omar Hakim. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were yeah. killing it, man. Omar. Oh. Yeah. I, I've talked to a lot of people who like have come up doing like comedy in the West Village near like Washington Square Park. And like they'd see Jocko just walk into the club, you know, just playing in the park. Yeah. And they yeah. just like stand there. Anybody who knew, anybody who was like, you know, hip to music was like, these people walking by have no idea who, what they're hearing right now. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Just New York so has changed so much. I mean, when you think about the days of him and Hiram and stuff at at fifty five grand, was that it? Fifty five bar. Yeah, yeah. Um, and all the cats that would come through there. I mean, I've only heard about it. Remember, Steve Bailey posted that picture of him and Jock. Was that at Rocco's tribute when he posted it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. He was such a young, he was so young, man. It's like, wow, he was there at ground zero. But it's amazing how he, how he just changed everything, Jocko. I mean, Stanley did too, but mm -hmm. it's amazing the power of music and how the power of certain musicians just change. Because yeah. we all change when Jocko hit, man. Well, that's how I define innovators. You know, like when when Tony came in, like all of a sudden you hear all these cats trying to play like that afterwards. On Same drums, with Elvin. Yeah. You know, when Elvin came, all of a sudden there's all these people that you just, it was just a wave, the ripples of the wave. And you were like that, Vic, man. When you, when you came, and I would have students come to me that were really young and they could do all the double thumping stuff. You know, mm -hmm. they probably came to me to learn chords or something. 
Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> I was like, man, you got you young bloods can do all that stuff already. You know, it's like that's where they're starting out. You know, exactly. It's just I was like, now that's the mark. That's the mark of a real innovator. You know. Yeah, I remember a lot of like a couple of uh, kids that I knew like growing up in high school and stuff. Like Flea was the one that they would just completely try to play like, and they'd spend hours just any any way that they could play like Flea. You know, yeah, he, he had that yeah. Too. Flea has that appeal. You know, people love him. And that's another visual, like you were talking about, like wearing pants made out of you know stuffed animal heads. You yeah, know. when they wore pants. <laughs> yeah, I was going to totally. say, I just remember them wearing only a sock. Yeah, right. A piece. Absolutely. Right. Right. That's a band that's like pretty interesting. You know, like their early stuff, like Freaky Styly mm-hmm. and all that. Like that's some really funky shit. That's when George Clinton yeah. was working with them too, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, because a lot of us musicians, the way, I, the way I like to say it, especially in jazz, you know, teaching at Berkeley, you deal with a lot of up and coming jazz musicians. And I literally spent a lot of time talking about it today. You know, I'm telling people, you have the gift. You just don't know how to deliver it. You know, and and, and people who might, for lack, for for at the at the risk of sounding disrespectful, people who might play a lesser style of music. You know, where you don't have to know all the harmony and the chords and stuff. They have the delivery thing down. Mm-hmm. And they're 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 stadium filling stadiums or whatever, you know. They understand the art of delivery, but you take a jazz musician who doesn't want to smile, doesn't want you know because Miles did it. We think that's the way jazz is supposed to be played, and you know the trumpet player is taking a great solo, and we're back there supporting that trumpet player, and then the trumpet player finishes a solo and walks off the stage. Like a, he's cool. I'm like, get back here, support me. <laughs> you know, stand next to me. At least give me some energy. Don't walk off. You know, after I've supported you. You know, that's the mentality. And we have a a, a young group of people who don't look at jazz beyond the Miles era. They yeah. don't realize that people used to dance to this music. Yes. You know. Talk right. about that golden age, man, when Duke yeah. Ellington was also the, it was the, simultaneously the highest art form and the pop music and the dance music. Yeah. Like, whoa. Yeah. Yes. Oh, lucky bastard. Yes. <laughs> you know? Like, so amazing. It's but now amazing. it's like, don't smile, you know, look too serious, play above the audience's head, make sure they don't understand it. You know, yeah, Colonel like, Bruce taught me a lot about that because I would I remember there were so many things that I I was a snob about. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I started going, OK, let me check out what what is it like? Even if I don't get it, we had a day off with the Almond Brothers and John Fogarty was playing the festival that we were at so I could get it to the festival but I didn't have anything to do all day. I saw he was playing. I was like, let me go see him because I never was into it. I was just like, this guy's famous. There's got to be some, mm. something that I'm missing, mm-hmm. right? So I went within the first four bars. I was like, oh, that's what it is. Because he had just had this projection. Like he hit the say, wow, bah. and then I was like, and as soon as he started saying, I was like, oh, that's it. It's just that whatever that it thing is, like yeah, he just man. had it. And what's as his style? I was listening for what I wanted to hear, and I didn't hear the style I wanted, so I just wrote it off. Yeah, you know. And I was yeah. like, "Oh man!" So now I'm always like going back and rechecking things that I don't like. <laughs> Let's see what <laughs> what I really think of it. Let me see yeah. it live. You know. Right. Right. Same here. I went through a lot of that. Madonna. He said, "Not get Madonna until." play a Madonna song and everybody gets up to dance. I play one of my own songs and nobody even listens. <laughs> you know, I'm like, wait a minute, who's wrong here? Who's missing something? <laughs> yeah. And I forget I heard that track uh, that Vinnie Caliuta played. It was something, actually, I think it might have been a video. I think he was really pissed off because he was making faces or something. At the person that he was the video. playing with Madonna? Yeah, but man, his pocket 
Oh. Yeah. Because he's such a complex, you know, just Mr. Yeah. Chop. I mean, he laid that funk, that pocket was just like so. I was like, man, that is yeah. a master right there. Yeah. His, his, his work with Zappa was like just absolutely mind blowing. Yeah. Mind blowing. That's so interesting to think about too, like just the showmanship and like listening with your eyes and stuff, you know, because like it's with all art. It's if you hold yourself to that, like, is everybody going to like, no, Miles was Miles. Bob Dylan was Bob Dylan, right? Like Chappelle is Chappelle. Like you can't, you got to be you, but you got to project it and you got to, you know, with stand up, I get very like nervous about being too act. What I tell like, like, I can't fake it. Like I try, I have no acting chops at all. I want to go up and talk and I, I can't hold a, uh, you know, a bit or hold a punchline and musicians, man, like I look to you guys and it's just like, you just totally like, you just own the moment just takes over. And it's like, you just, you're sending it to the person in the back row. And that's very hard to do. Takes I think practice. we're doing different versions of the same thing. You know, for, for one it's entertainment, but we're really using expression of ourselves to entertain people. And like you say, you have to be you. Everybody we love. That's why we love them. We love John Fogarty because not because he sounds like Bob Dylan. Right. Because he doesn't sound like anybody else. Right. I love Willie Nelson because nobody has a voice like that. Bob Dylan, I wonder if he, if he, if he can even sing. Is he, can he really even sing? That's a question. <laughs> but there is no one like him. Right. So we love him. And to me, that's the thing that really draws people in whether we realize it or not or not is that when someone realizes who they are so strongly it touches a, a part of who we are and we re, and we relate to it so the fact that you're not an actor and you just have to be yourself to me that's what we're that's what we're looking for yeah you know yeah colonel bruce helped me with that so much man and that's one of the things about your book both of them you know, that, that struck me so hard because the colonel was trying to help me get to myself. You know, he was like, you're putting up uh, barriers to yourself by putting up this image that you have of yourself that's incomplete. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. He's like, if, you know, I want this what's behind that. Behind yeah. the curtain, he's like, that's what I see, and you're afraid of it. And I think it's beautiful. Right. I think you need to let that out, like yeah. all the way out, you know? And that's <laughs> that's a beautiful person to run into to have for a mentor that's trying to help you get to you, you know? Because it's like, I tell my students, I was like, you have to give people the one thing they can't get anywhere else. You have to give them something they can't get anywhere else, and it's the easiest thing to give them. It's you. There's only one of you, even if you're a twin. <laughs> you <know? laughs> like, Very true. Yeah. Very yeah. true. There's only one. I mean, you got a fingerprint, an individual fingerprint to prove it. That there's only one. Yeah. 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 But you, you talk about my book, you know, and my book has this character named Michael, who's the teacher. Right. I wanted to and, ask you about him. <laughs> well, I mean, you you live with one. Yeah, I mean, you know, Colonel Bruce. When I'm writing the personalities of these characters, you know, I'm thinking of real people. You know, one is my good friend, Michael Cott. I don't know if you've ever met Michael Cott, but sure. also Colonel Bruce, totally. You know, it's like he's that, that, that strangeness type of personality that keeps you guessing. But what he's saying is so hip, you have to pay attention. But then, but, but, he, but he never let, it's, like, it's almost like they never let you know, are, they, are you really serious? <laughs> you know, like, are they crazy or genius? And then what's the difference, you know? I think the crazy ones play the fool so that they don't get assassinated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Columbo approach to life, dude. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even joking. Like, yeah. they, would have to, they would come for it because they'd be like, that guy's an E.T., you know. So we need to put him in a 
tube and study him you know well, that's yeah. like shakespeare yeah. like all the smartest <laughs> all the smartest characters in shakespeare were the fools you know oh, wow. the that's jesters the court and the jester clowns. yeah yeah that's right. They, were, yeah. they would be narrating what was going on inside the king's mind. You know what I mean? And and that's being in touch. And the they comedians. could say the truth. Comedians. Yeah. yeah. The comedians. They exactly. could tell the truth without getting assassinated. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it was really, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Just right. kidding. Got to go. <laughs> Follow me on Instagram. Yes. <laughs> but you I are. love how you like in the, in the new book, and I don't want to spoil it too much you know i don't know how much you want to reveal or not but Go the way it, you man. talk about the spirit of music and and personalizing like that's i love that man i look at things that way as a spiritual person yeah some of my favorite uh theologians like td jakes will talk about you know don't let a spirit of jealousy settle and take root in you don't let a spirit of this. He doesn't say, you know, anger. He said, don't let the spirit of anger take root in you. And so when you talk about the spirit of music calling out, I was like, oh, wow. Like you had a profound effect on me at the very beginning of this book. I, I literally turned down a bunch of gigs recently mm -hmm. because I didn't want to like backtrack and go back and get in a 15 passenger van and drive to all this stuff. And now I'm doing my yoga this morning, listening to your thing that you were talking about how, uh, you know, uh, bluegrass is taught under a tree. It's not taught in school. Like we have to hear music live. And then I just, I'm in downward dog. And I just start crying or plank or whatever. It's like, you got to get out there and get in that van, man. You mm. got to go let people hear the big thing. And, it was because of the way you characterize it as the spirit of music. It had a profound effect on me, man. I appreciate that, O2. I really, really do. It's had a profound effect on me um, so much that I started feeling the need to share it. Um, but like the comedian who can say the truth but not have to defend it because it's just a joke, I decided to write fictional stories, but put the truth in there, but I don't have to defend it. <laughs> and that's why I did it that way. Like the stories in there may be true, they may not be. Don't worry <laughs> about it. Yeah. But the lessons are real. You that's know? why I tell and, people about religion. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, look, you're, you know, if you get mad at religion, you're doing, you're only looking at the Bibles, which are, whichever ones they are, or gods, whichever ones they are, as defined by the most right wing and orthodox ones. Yeah. Now you're yeah. operating only on their level. Like God is only on that level. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, the, I always say it's this uh, pastor Rob Bell. And he says, the question is not, did Adam and Eve happen? The question is, does Adam and Eve happen? And so when yeah. I read the Bible I, and then I saw myself in it on page one, Bingo. it had my number. And I was like, oh man, there's a lot more pages in here. <laughs> 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 Man, I mean, really? Had my number. You know, Victor, writing like that too can also free up a lot of guilt in writing. Like, because I think when you want to tell the truth, but you've got a a guilt thing or a conscience thing, and you want to tell that story, you can characterize like experiences you had. You can personify emotions that you've gone through, and it's freeing. I started Absolutely. doing that during this past year, not even joke wise, just writing wise on a couple things I'm working on and it's helping a ton. Absolutely. Playing music does the same thing in a certain way. You can get things out. Cool thing about music, nobody has to understand it. You can just get it out there. But writing was the same way. I learned so much about myself. And it's like I, I had heard of, of, of uh, you know, Stephen King and different great authors saying that the characters uh, alluding to something about where the characters start writing their parts or whatever. Yeah. You know, I totally found that where I'm 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 writing something and I'm going, whoa, 
never thought of that. That's cool. That's really cool, you know, and learning from it. But I think music hits a certain part of your brain, certain part of your your being, I should say. Writing hits another part, right? Telling jokes probably hits another part. Working in the garden, another part. You know, that's why I, I, I the truth is everywhere. You know, in religion, they say everything came from God. That means everything is God. You know, what did God do? Invent something that wasn't him or her to make us out of? Oh, that means that, that means that, what that means to me is if if God has created everything, that means God is everywhere. That means you can find your truth everywhere. Through anywhere. everything. Yeah. Everything. Through this right. Table. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. It's like your mom so, said in the book, you heard God that because you were you could hear it through the music. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. So, so you listen to music more than, better than you listen to anything else. That's why God's speaking to you that way. Well, what should I do, Mom? Listen. listen. <laughs> that's what she said. Listen, child. You yeah. know? But that's the thing. We want to talk more than we listen. Right. And we need to do both because God gave us the ability to do both. But as some people say, he gave us two ears. <laughs> yep. And only one mouth. <laughs> so, you know. It's uh it's that's <laughs> my favorite quote of your mom's is, <laughs> this happened to me. She said, uh, you don't want to say you're never gonna do something because that's the first thing to put you on the road to doing it. Exactly. <laughs> I was telling a friend of mine about that today. I said there's yeah. only two things I said I n- was never going to do in my entire life. <laughs> One was to get married again a second time. <laughs> and the second was to have children. And yeah. I had already had a vasectomy by the time I said the second one. So I was pretty damn sure about that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bam, bam. And then bam. Now I got right. two kids. I was like, I just laugh yeah. every day. And so I was like, it's yeah. true. <laughs> so you can, you can imagine O'Till being a kid. And, oh. you know, and you, and your mom's telling you that, you know, cause mm-hmm. you know, you, I'm a hard headed kid. All five of us probably were. I know I was. I ain't never going to whatever, boy. <laughs> Don't ever say what you're not going to do, because that's your yeah. first step toward doing it. <laughs> because whatever you say, life's going to make you prove it. Oh, Ooh. that's the thing. That's the way yeah. life works. Yeah. Right. On, this is the way I, on Earth, life works in opposites. Yes. Right. To move forwards, I got to push backwards. Right. Mm-hmm. For for me to be good, there has to be bad. For there to be the light has to be dark. That's why in religion we have God and we consider the devil evil. I, I'm sorry, equal. We have the yeah. God and the devil. And when I was a kid, I used to worry it because I heard so many stories about the devil. Oh, to your parents, maybe too. But they, there were stories about, you know, devil people getting possessed or the devil's riding you. I could tell you stories that my parents told, but I used to worry about the devil until one day my mom said, boy, who you think made the devil? (laughs) And then it hit me. Oh, they not equal. And then I was like, yeah, you know, like, like on earth, we, we can't understand this without that. It's so all we polarity. equalize everything, but I believe that's a part of what being physical is. Yes. And earth is physical. It's this mm-hmm. plane. Yeah. So the way it works here, the way I see it is to have something, you have to have something else. So, so let's say I want to be a light unto the world, mm. but my light is only, let's say my light is a match, but the room's already bright. If I light a match in this room, it ain't going to cast no more light. But if this match says, I want to be a light, I want to be a light, God. It's got to get dark around this match. Yeah. So that the match can right, brighten up the room. But what it usually happens to us is that it gets dark so we can do what we say we want to do. But we succumb to the darkness. We forget yep. what we ask, that we ask for. You want to be the light? 
<laughs> you right. asked. You asked. You asked. And, and, and that's the way it worked, you know. And I started figuring this out in, uh, when my brother Joseph uh, started dating Heidi. You, I'm, OT, I knew you mm-hmm. have to remember Joseph's first wife, Heidi. Mm-hmm. Heidi could cook, man. <laughs> that's right. And my brothers were, all, I'm the only one that eats meat, right? My brothers were vegetarian, and I always wanted to be like them. And I, I knew better than to try. <laughs> but, you know, I, and Roy got into fasting, so I try to go a few days without eating. But every day I plan to fast, Heidi would call, say, Victor, <laughs> I made some chicken parmesan today. You There's that match so calling like, again. <laughs> and it's like life saying, OK, you want to fast? Fast. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're not going to make it easy for you. Because you wave that chicken at you. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Yes. <laughs> Wow. But anyway, anyway. <laughs> I'd say that when people, uh, it, and it, it just came to me like literally a couple of weeks ago, maybe a week ago or so, people are saying there's just so much messed up stuff in the Bible. And I was like, well, there has to be. Can't be all good or else it would just be BS. Like, this, right. it's talking about us. So yeah. let's just keep it real. <laughs> that means it's every manner, like, what are soap operas? Just every kind of way that we could justify or use some excuse to do wrong and then how it turns out like all the myriad ways the mind works yeah you know they talk they talk about it in 12-step programs Mm -hmm. addiction they call it cunning because just like you described the devil, you know, it's yeah. like, wow, yeah. man. And it's yeah. a seed and it's a thought sometimes. And that's the that thing that's take hard. take root. Exactly. And then exactly. sprout and then bear fruit. Yep. Oh, you don't want to let the yep. w- wrong one. You know, it's I the know. point of that story, man. The agricultural metaphors and the parental metaphors are just perfect, man. Yep. Sure. The agricultural ones for teaching you patience. Things happen in their time. You don't plant a flower and expect it to bloom like that, bear fruit, you know, or just what, like, it, it happens yeah. in its time, in its stages. Yep. You know, right. it's just like, there's so much just simple logic. I want to write a book that's basically about, it called spiritual logic, because the people that don't believe in the mystical, I get it. The, the right brain stuff seems like nonsense to the left brain. Right, but there is a logic to it. It's it's really basic. It's simple. It's just difficult, you know. <laughs> simple well, is just difficult. <laughs> I like that. Well, it's also that it's also that that uh, that notion of like admitting you don't know, and that freeing you up to the fact that that truth that you were holding on to for so long, maybe wasn't a truth. It was just the thought of a truth, and you can go back and compartmentalize it and categorize it as a thought at a time. A and you don't truth. Have to, yeah. You know, it's just it's, humility when you do that because right. every system teaches. Sure. Every yeah. religion, like, you know, you can't come in <laughs> cocky. You know, it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's just the idea of, of not like I, I, I had a doctor's appointment today and I was talking to this doctor and he was like, every single patient, no matter what, COVID comes up in conversation, the vaccine comes up in conversation, and he goes, literally, we're two countries. He's like, it's just, it's, and how many times have we said that we're at least two, probably three, <laughs> but, you know, he just, I think three. and he, he just said so humbly and so honestly, he's like, just everyone is so, like, scared to admit that the truth that they've been believing so hard isn't the truth, you know, and it's just, it's literally like, it it's so palpable and so visible now. And it's like, when you admit, I don't know anything, I don't know anything. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to learn more. It frees you up. You don't have to hold on to a thought anymore. You could just be, you know, let me learn from this and take whatever I can, you know, bring with me and move on to the next thing with that knowledge. I don't know where my own spleen is. I mean, (laughs) I know, right. And it's mine. (laughs) Supposedly. (laughs) But but truth is fluid. Right? We want we want truth to be fixed. And that's the problem. It's not. Right? And and and, and what I mean is is I mean 
You tell me something that's truthful and I can show you where it's not. Right. Anything. Right. Right. I mean, you're, you're, you're riding in the car, listening to music with the window down and I'm standing on the side of the street as your music goes by. For me, the music changes pitches. <laughs> For you in the car, it doesn't. Who's right? We can argue all day. Right. We can sit here and look at the same tree and describe it. There is no way for you to see the tree the same way I do. It's impossible. Even if we're standing next to each other, our view is still different. So in a sense, truth is individual. If we can agree what the context is, then we can agree what truth is. Right. Right. Yeah. This is a bass guitar. <clears throat> this is jazz. But we have to have a context first. Right. And, you know, even in, in religion, they talk about the golden rule. Do unto others as you would like to be done unto whatever. But but what if you like. You know, getting cut or whatever, you know, what if what if you yeah. like stuff I don't like? Don't don't do that to me. Yeah. <laughs> you, know what, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I so, think about that with politics a lot. Like Dick Cheney's truth is true. Like, you know, it's it's like the the in Game of Thrones when Lannister says, what does the lion care what the lamb thinks? <laughs> you know, yeah. like to them, it's like if somebody's going to be there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser and I'm going to be the winner. Right mm -hmm. now, his truth is true. Right. I, I have a, a, a different truth that I like to live by. I appreciate his honesty, though. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Because he said, if I could do it again, I'd do it again. You know, at least mm -hmm. he was honest yeah, about yeah. what his truth was. And I do appreciate that. So people that mask what their truth is, it's like, which we all do to a certain extent. But I mean, you know, yeah. We don't reveal but, everything. And, and at the same time, my brother Joseph is really good at talking about this and, and much better than me. And just as important, if not more important, of knowing what the truth is, is only one part of it, but how you display that truth. And in many cases, especially in politics, we want to beat you up with the truth. Right. Make you feel bad because I've got the truth and you don't. And that's not what the truth is for. <laughs> You know, it's it's like life. That music really is is the for me the greatest example I can use to show how life should be lived. Um, like for for example, I was just talking to my brother in law about this. I played on a TV show twice with a guy named Mike Huckabee. Yeah. Now, Mike Huckabee's heavy Republican. He's a bass not, player, right? Ba he plays bass, and I'm yeah. not Republican. So we, if we were to talk about politics, which we don't, we haven't. We, if we were, we'd probably disagree. But we don't do that. We play music together. And to play music together, we agree to agree before we even start. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Before we even start, we agree to agree. So I've been toying with the idea of writing Mike Huckabee a letter, and I'm saying it publicly now because it might get me to do it because <laughs> I like Mike Huckabee. He's an amazing guy. He's funny, kind, courteous, but I didn't like his politics on his show. And to keep his show, I know he has to be that way. He has to be Republican and the Democrats have to be his uh, what did he call it? My opponents. Natural you know, let enemy. you know it's a game. Yeah. Right? And, and my yeah. opponents, and they, but he was making fun of these women and, and all this stuff, the Democrats. And I want to write him a letter to say, Mr. Huckabee, when we were on, when I was on your show, we, ac we actually played together. We played What's Going On, Marvin Gaye. Oh, whoa. Wow. Right? That's deep. Great <laughs> song, right? Yeah. So I played the melody, he played the bass line. I want to say, listen, Mr. Huckabee, you should try, try treating politics like you treat music. Yeah. Wow. Because if I had treated music 
like you treat politics, I could have made you lose. Yeah. Right. We're both playing the same instrument. I could have won that game, Mr. Huckabee, yeah. on your own show. Yeah. I could have showed your whole audience how much of a loser you are <laughs> standing next to me. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. What? Yeah. Music isn't about that. So why is politics? Because yeah. when we play together, nobody loses. No one should have to lose with politics either. Well, because the whole aim of it is 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 lost because we forget they're public servants. We pay their bills. Right. Yes. So yeah. we should be the boss, right? But that's the problem. We oh. don't pay their bills. Citigroup pays their bills, and Raytheon play, <laughs> pays their bills, and Monsanto pays their bills, and then somebody that's from cool. Monsanto's in the FDA is like, "Hey, wait, 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 <laughs> wait a minute." You're getting deep. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. The Raytheon guy's the Secretary of Defense. Oh, but he's black, uh -oh. so it's okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's my other thing, yeah. the identity oh. politics thing. I'm oh. like, oh, man. <laughs> but, you know. They're going to yeah. cancel this show. What's the name <laughs> of this show? <laughs> <laughs> really, they're going to put me together with Parlor, just in the same little group. <laughs> No, yeah. but that's the thing. It's like a, it's it's a mischaracterization now of what it's supposed to be. When we remember, oh, there's supposed to be public service. So like, I was the one that donated to your campaign. I gave you my vote, and I, you know, you said you were going to do this. I expected you to do that, and now you did. So we got it. It's a tangled mess to untangle with yeah. that, you know. But yeah. we use music for that too. You know? Yeah, I mean, for me, as we see, to me, the solutions are going to have to come from the bottom up. Absolutely. Yeah. As they always have. Always. And music yeah. is a great way to do it. Comedy is a great way to mm -hmm. do it. Writing the truth is one of the best ways to do it, too, man. I the mean, arts. Yeah. yeah. And writing stories. That's why yeah. I say, like, you know, Star Wars and Harry Potter is right up there with the Bible. To me, you know, I mean, yeah. it's the stories that are, that yeah. matter. They're telling you, you know, how love operates inside of us and the opposite operates inside of us, you know? Right. Exactly. Victor, exactly. Before, before you sat down and like put pen to paper, did you like have the end in mind or did you sit down and just start and know you had to tie it up eventually? Just start. You know, like when I'm writing a song, I, I don't know how it's, I, I don't usually know how it's going to end. When we start a conversation, I don't usually know how it's going to end. Right. You know, I like that fact. Now, the second book, the, the Spirit of Music, I knew a whole lot less about mm -hmm. than the first book, The Music Lesson. The book, The Music Lesson, was based off of a class that I teach where we break music into 10 parts. You know, notes is only one part. We focus on notes all the time. But notes is only one part. You know, of course, there's rhythm, tone, articulation, phrasing, technique, space, feel, listening, you know, all yeah. these different parts. And so I used to, I, I still, I teach a class where we look at, we number all these different parts of music, one through 10. And one is notes, not because it's important. But I just start there because we already know about that. So let's put that aside. Let's, what else is there besides notes? And we, we look at the numbers two through ten, and then we come up with exercises on how to play those. Because that's, that's the stuff music theory leaves out. Mm. There's no theory or, or exercises for space. Right. But if you don't understand it, your notes aren't going to work. You know, so yeah. I've been talking about this for years at, at my camps. And then people were saying, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. And I still think people were asking for an instruction book, like a Wooten method or whatever. Yeah, right. Exactly what I didn't want and still don't. Mm. You know, I like pointing in directions, but I don't want to tell you where to go, you know, or what to do. But I was uh, I was going to South, uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, to Steve Bailey's house to work on a, a early basic streams project, two bases. And Steve picked me up from the airport. And in the passenger seat was a brand new copy of a book by Richard Bach called Illusions. And uh, Richard Bach also wrote a <laughs> popular book called Jonathan Livingston Siegel. 
very popular back mm -hmm. in the 80s and stuff. So anyway, this still to date one of my favorite books by Richard Bach or favorite books by anyone called Illusions. And it's about a teacher and a student and they're flying biplanes. They take passengers up, let, let them see their house from above. But this one teacher, Donald Shimoda, is just mystical. Like bugs don't crash on his windshield. Like when he's landed, he just floats his plane down. And the other guy, Richard, is like, how are you doing this? And, and Donald Shimoda is, is crazy teaching him. And I'm holding this book in Steve's front seat thinking, man, I read this book when I was about 15, 14, 15, because my brothers did. I did everything they did. And it hit me. I said, I bet I could write this book now. Light bulb went off. That's the way to do it. Don't nice. write a music instruction manual. Write a <laughs> fictional story. Yeah. And then put the lessons in there. That way the people who want the lessons will find it. Those who just want a story, story's there. Yeah. <clears throat> but fantastic. I knew I had more to say. I got into it after I wrote. And I knew, you know, that book came out in 2008, The Music Lesson. Um, and I started writing again in 2011, The Spirit of Music, but it wasn't flowing. So I just put it, I didn't force it. I was under no contract to write another book. So I put it aside until 2017. In 2017, I got my 2011 notes back out, which I thought was going to be horrible because I wasn't feeling it. And I read it and it says, ooh, this is cool stuff. The phasers, really? It's like, wow, I was shocking myself. Let's finish this. And so I went ahead and finished it to where it is now. But I knew back then I had more to say. But I was there's 20 chapters, I think, in this new book. And I was probably at chapter 15, maybe, when I finally realized how it's going to end. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's really kick ass, man. It's probably just it's like life. <laughs> well, you know, exactly. well, what's funny too is like to bring it back to what we were talking about with the truth, right? Like you said, if you're on the sidewalk and a car drives by, it's two different <clears throat> interpretations of the truth. I'll take it to another level where if I'm anxious or I'm stressed out or I'm thinking too much and I look out the window and I see leaves falling off the tree, I'm like, great, I'm going to have to go rake those and whatever. And then I sit down and meditate for 20 minutes and I open my eyes and look at the tree and I'm like, how amazing is it that I get to sit here and watch these leaves fall <laughs> to another part of their life? So 20 minutes ago, my truth was different. So that guy driving could be having a totally different truth when he passed yeah. you and when he hit that red light. So to go back and look at your notes, it's still you. But the truth about that content, that's that's really inspiring, man. That's really awesome. That That's that's life. Yeah. That's life. That's why I say truth is fluid. People ask me all the time, is, is that book real? Did that really happen? Did Michael really show up? I say, what difference does it make? You weren't there. <laughs> it, it's a story yeah. either way. <laughs> For, to you, it's a story. So even, even, even if I said, yeah, Mike, it really happened just like that. If you like me and trust me, you'll believe it. Right. So I say, of course it happened. What do you mean? Of course. So you would decide to believe it. But then I go, no, nah, I'm just kidding, Mike. It didn't happen. Then you would decide not to believe it. Right. It's always up to you. That's why there's a part in the book <laughs> where my character asked Michael, uh, because some crazy stuff I won't go into happens in the book. And Michael's always, the teacher's always making you question <clears throat> You know, did he really set this up to make this happen? So, you know, he says, Michael, did you ever lie to me? Michael says, of course. Said, All of life is a lie. I'm like, what? So then I said, well, did you ever tell me the truth? He says, of course. All of life is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, what are you talking about? He said, it's up to you to decide. You know? yeah. Colonel Bruce did that to me all the time. He goes, Otil, when I'm lying, I'm telling the truth. And when I'm telling the truth, I'm lying. And he was lying. Because <laughs> yes. yes. I'll be damned if the stuff that this, it, it seemed like it couldn't be true. Yeah. And it just, ha he did it over and over again. And I was like, how? 
Does well, he o, do o, that? O, 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 when you, when you, <laughs> or or Zach, or the little I got, you know, talking with Matt Monday way back in the days, when you guys would say stuff like that, especially in my later days talking to Zach on tour about current man, I'm taking notes of this crazy stuff, and some oh, yeah. of that stuff ends up in my books. I remember That's when you told me, happened. I asked you, I said, is this cat real? And he said, well, he's a composite of, of a bunch of people I know. And then you were like, <clears throat> Colonel Bruce is one of them. And you were like, actually, you're one of them, O'Teal. And I was like, man, now I got to go back and read the book because I should be able to pick out which part is me, <laughs> you know. And uh, I, just, I haven't had the chance to do it yet, but that blew it's, me away. You know, it's, it's all my influencers. You know, and Mike, I don't know if you you know Otil and I go back. Yes, um, yes, very much. I mean, so. we we're, we were pro, were we we were out of our teen <laughs> ages when we met, or were we in the twenties? Nineteen. Or? We were nineteen. Okay. When we met. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so, you know, for one, it's, it's it's another set of brothers. Yeah. Who 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 aren't good? They're much beyond good on the instrument. You know, Billy so Drummond. All, Remember Billy, Billy Drummond? Drummond? He said, I think the Burbage brothers need to meet the Wooten brothers. <laughs> <laughs> he took and Billy, <laughs> Billy introduced me to so much stuff. He played me my first Jocko. Really? You know, Billy Drummond yeah. did? Wow. Yeah. He, uh, who else? Did he, he turned me on to a bunch of my first stuff, you know. Um, great drummer. Wow. But, but... You know, o O'Till and Kofi had a whole different thing that us brothers didn't have musically. Like O'Till oh, heard we have... was that? I said, what do we have that you guys said? <laughs> no, I mean I mean O'Till, you know, you and Kofi heard music differently. And and still do, you know. And I admire it. And I just had to finally admit. I just don't hear music that way huh. until O'Till plays it. <laughs> then I hear it. You know what I mean? It doesn't come out of me that way. It doesn't, it doesn't, I have to hear it for it to come out that way. Then I can kind of try to imitate it. And I used to do that a lot to try to, and then I realized that's, that's him, you know, but at the same time though, um, we could have conversations. And, and I always felt like the young guy, you know, and, but I was a good listener. But I, I, you know, my brothers and Roy and O'Till and Kofi, they could talk about stuff. I've never been a heavy theory guy, but O'Till would get with Reggie and they'd be talking about letters and numbers and chords and stuff that I never got and understood, you know. Yeah. But um, I paid attention. I really paid attention. And in many cases... You know, of course, if somebody said something that stuck out, boom, you know, like what Colonel Bruce says or what, you know, I'd write some of these things down and because uh, I've got a I've got a, a whole file full of just stuff that somebody said this or that. But so all of that, all of that childhood influence winds up in the books yeah. now. In the, yeah. in the story of the music lesson in the spirit of music, I rarely talk about my brothers. I rarely yeah, talk about true. those other people because, and I did that on purpose. I think everybody kind of, if they know me, they know that story. The youngest, the five brothers, blah, blah, blah. So I made it a different story just to take it. To, to make it not so autobiographical, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's something that you wow. say that about uh, me and Kofi's playing because, um, and that you say that about the chords and stuff because all the chords that I was trying to find, um, you were playing all that stuff already, but you were doing it with two hands. Like I needed extra strings to like do it uh, vertically, I guess, in the way I think about it, you know. And you uh -huh. were like putting them, like the interval that would be up here. You're putting it back down in here, like what's what's what Jocko did, you know, and Stanley and Alfonso and all our heroes, because you have to on four string, 
you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, to me, it's like you were playing all that stuff already. It's like my teacher tells me, you know, he's like, well, Teal, you pl-, I ask him something. He goes, you playing that already? I'm like, where? He goes, <laughs> oh, you know, that sixth thing you do. And I was like, and then I find it and I go, oh, yeah, I am playing that. <laughs> <You know>? oh, <laughs> like, <my God. laughs> just like... But I, I have that problem of like trying to look at things on the chalkboard is harder. And if I do it by ear, then I just find it. You, It's something I wanted to ask you too, Vic, is I often have this thing with rhythm. And it's just something that I noticed from being a drummer and playing African drums and, and just these grooves. Like if you get into a groove, the groove will teach you itself. Right. And when you said that thing about the spirit of music, I was like, yeah, like being just plucking your hands down on different keys on the piano. The harmony will teach you itself. Absolutely. The, the groove will teach it. You find that same thing? Oh, till a thousand percent, a thousand percent. But you got to get your mindset. And I don't mean you, per, uh, you yeah. know, particularly out of this. Yeah. It ain't here. Right. It'd be like trying to talk and, and focusing on your mouth, the instrument. Yeah, yeah. It ain't there. This is just a tool we express through. Yeah. Right. Like I, I tell people all the time, I'm a much better bass player before I touch the bass. <laughs> Seriously, I'm a good quarterback on my couch. Right. Yeah. Totally. So it's, it's like that. But yeah. as soon as I pick up the bass, now all that stuff that's inside I got to try to get out It's the vehicle. So it's like talking. Now we're trying to, when we talk, we're describing something that's inside. And in many cases, we can't find the words and we talk all the time. So imagine trying to express it on an instrument that we don't play all the time. And I've played bass, you know, over 50 years, but still it's not as comfortable as talking. So I get frustrated trying to get out what what's in here. But, When I learn, Otil, and I know you, any musician has touched on this. When I really make friends with what's in there, it's much easier. Yeah. When my attention is on whatever that is, rather than here, you know, this instrument, much easier. And that's what I talk about in this book, making friends of the reality of music because music music exists anyway you can hear it in your head but like a real child for music to be born on earth meaning to become physical to vibrate it needs a, a, a a musician a mother or you know what and an instrument, a father. Even if that instrument is the voice, it needs these two things. That's how things work on earth. It's, they call it the Holy Trinity. For music to be born, we need this and that to come together and then boom, music becomes physical. But it doesn't mean it didn't already exist. That's right. It's like a child. Oh, till you have a baby boy, right, and a girl, you know that there was something there before that baby came out. Yeah. They come out with a personality, Ooh. a character. <laughs> yeah. Right? So music's the same way. But like a, a real person, entity, maybe to be safer, it already exists. So if we, if, if we can... Uh, uh, pair or or relate or recognize that and make friends with that entity. Then you realize you're not doing it yourself. Man, music becomes a whole lot easier. And anyone who's played enough gigs has reached that place. And people will say, man, it felt like the music was playing me. Or Michael Jordan says, man, it felt like the rim was this big, you know, or or whatever. We we call it the zone. You know right. that uh, the Indian classical Indian, they say there's a point, you know, when you're really warmed up and you're playing and the guru takes over, you know, and then you're not playing 
anymore like that. It's I love that man. It's I I think of it as like the way Sun Ra said it. He said, "The problem with mankind is they're out of tune with the universe." If we talked about that, Mike, tuning up to the key of love when yep, I get pissed of off love. about politics. Yeah, you know? I tell you. Yeah. I get go, on the right frequency, man. I go off, <laughs> you know. <laughs> if Which we're all tuned in. Sometimes you know? I think that's a good thing. It's necessary in its right season. My season <laughs> tends to be a li- <laughs> run a little long. But, you know, it's like if you if you tune up to that frequency where now you're making friends with the music – then you get this, uh, it's like a, someone said, I feel like I'm drinking from a fire hydrant. You know, so much will come into you, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, your cup will runneth over, you know, <laughs> like. Yeah. With, with but, st- it got to a point. Oh, go ahead, Victor. I'm sorry. No, 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 please. No, I was just thinking about while you were saying that, I was just thinking about like, you know, my career on the road and, per- and performing and doing stand up and getting to the point where you appreciate silence which was the thing you're so afraid of in the beginning because if you tell a joke and it doesn't hit as fast as you thought it would and you're kind of like you guys get it this room full of strangers you you know like do you guys get it and i started to realize that like silence was the place where you can like put a more profound thought up front and then let that just sit and ruminate for a minute and it gives you a lot more places to go with a, with a, with a punchline or a tag or including the crowd. And I started to realize that I would do my worst when I would sit alone and go over stuff in my head before I went on stage, Mm. I'd get up and just Mm. rush through it. So what I started to do, no matter where I was, I would talk to the, the person that was closest to the green room right before I went on stage. Even if it was someone in the crowd, I would just be like, you having a good time tonight? Like breaking balls? Like, what are you, what are you eating? just to free myself up and be like, these are people and I'm a person and we're going to have this moment that's never going to happen anywhere else ever again. And it made it human, you know, it made it kind of real. And if I fucked up, I fucked up. If I did good, I did good. And I was okay with it being what it was and that's it. But you got out of your head. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Remember when Einstein would, uh, he would be trying to solve the problem and he'd just be like, I'm stumped. He'd go play violin and then it would come to him. <laughs> yeah. You just got to step aside and yeah. let let everything just breathe. And then <laughs> it's like you were like, I, blah, I just like, blah, okay, let me go talk to somebody and let's, <laughs> let's just let this thing breathe. So I can, you know. That's it. That's yeah. it. That's I, it. the way it works. Yeah. I remember early on sitting and watching some comics that were like dealing with a a drunk person in the in a New York Friday night crowd, Upper East Side Club, where they're just there killing time till the next thing they're gonna go ruin, you know? And uh someone would be up there pouring their heart out, this material they've been dying to put out there, and you know, this person would interrupt and they would snap and scream at them and be, Would you shut the fuck up? Like, come on, you know, I don't come to your house and whatever and you'd see the whole room would just seize up all the energy was gone and then they built themselves an uphill battle and then you watch the then you watch the pros you know yeah they're like <laughs> here we go you know <laughs> david tell or big j or something you know they'd just be like sweetheart what's going on is everything are you having an okay night like you know i didn't mean to did i say something that upset you and totally turns it where they're almost bashful and apologetic now and the whole crowd's like supporting them getting along and it turns into this beautiful moment and it's somehow the comic won. and it's like, yeah. but she feels good about it. And that's the jazz of comedy. I think, you know what I mean? That's the thing that like, you don't really know what's going to happen. You got to play the pauses and you know, it's just Colonel Bruce used to say there's, there's no bad, re- the, the, the worst reaction is as valuable to him as the best. He always, he never talked about any good reviews. He always showed me his worst reviews. There's a, I never forget his crowning achievement. His Mount Everest of reviews was sick, sickening. Uh, no, uh, sickening, hateful, and a waste of money. And then his other, his second to that was more half baked than pretending. <laughs> oh, wow. 
<laughs> he just was like, yeah. <laughs> he loved it. He was proud of that. Was, these are, yeah, these are his Grammys. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I just could never get enough of him. I was like, I got to What is it with this guy? <laughs> wow, I love it. I love it. See, that, for me, that's my, that's my Michael in the book. That's it right there. That's why I had to ask you. I was like, is it real? Because he was so real for me. Like the guy, you know, I met yeah. a real one yes. that just would like, it was. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Those are his Grammys. <laughs> <laughs> That's so amazing. <laughs> you know, I'm fascinated that. though by this thing that I keep seeing. Um, you know, I've, we've just been reading this Ram Das autobiography. And he, he gets to this point where he's gone through all this stuff, like, and then he meets uh, Maharaji. And now he's speaking to Maharaji through an interpreter because he doesn't speak any Hindi, you know. Mm. And then Maharaji looks at him. He's just met him. And he says, spleen. <laughs> and, <he's> like, <laughs> and his mother died because... She had cancer and her spleen swole up right. really big. And and he's like, what did you say? I mean, he had been doing a lot of acid right before then and brought a lot with him. Yeah. And he's, what did you say? Funeral. And he goes, spleen. And he said his whole world just came down all at once because this person did something impossible and I remember that moment when Colonel Bruce did it to me, when he guessed my birthday within three minutes of my birthday. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, I saw him do it a hundred times after that. But when it happened to me, that one time I was like, Whoa, and I knew I, that I was going to follow him. Like until it, I was like, I got to figure out whatever that is, you know? And so, and then I see this in other, I hear this in other stories of people meet someone that does this impossible. I was wondering, Victor, do you ever have, because that's what Michael sounds like to me, but have you ever had that experience for real? Like someone doing something, you're like, wait a minute, how, you know, did you ever meet somebody like that? Yeah. I seek those people out, man. Me too. The weird yeah. one, the weirdos. Oh, that guy's <laughs> weird. I'm like, let me go edge up next to him. <laughs> or yeah. Her, you know. Yeah, you know, in 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 this new in the new book, I mean, there's, you know, I I could tell different stories of different people, but I included a guy that's who, who's in the in he he appears at the end of the music lesson, a young kid named Jonathan. Yeah. And in, in the new book, Jonathan shows up early and you get to find out who Jonathan is and why he's in my in, in my character's life. But Jonathan came to my second or my third camp. He's from Portland, Oregon. And, you know, we 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 have a shuttle that picks people up from the airport and drops them off at camp. And I try to if I'm at camp already, I try to make sure I meet every shuttle as people are getting off. Man, this guy gets off the bus. He's got some blue jeans on. He's got on a cape, a black cape, American flag wrapped around his head, you know. Yeah. And we're like. <laughs> we got a hot one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. John Fogarty's here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, but literally a cape. I want to meet this dude. And um, and and found out uh, he said, he had, you know, he was uh, he was autistic. Um, Sweet. That's awesome. But uh, just brilliant. I mean, just yeah. brilliant. And, you know, and there's some things I write about the character, Jonathan, and I write a lot of it in there with with my friend Jonathan's permission. But he would do things like for like when the doctor as a kid would say, well, you're, you know, uh, Mrs. Chase, your son, Jonathan, you know, he'll never be able to do this. He won't be able to live alone. He won't be able to drive a car or work with his hands and stuff. He said it just made, let him know what to work on. Wow. And so he now he, he gigs playing bass, lives in his own apartment, drives to his gigs, 
You know, whenever I play in, in, in Portland and then I play in Seattle, I ride with him. He drives. You know, he said, uh, I guess I guess autistic people maybe this probably teenagers, period, have trouble like really engaging people eye to eye. So he said he used to practice on drunk people at his gigs. You know, he wow, would just go really? to the bar and sit next to drunk people and stare at them and talk to them just to get good at looking at people's eye, at, in their eyes because he was told he couldn't do it. Wow. And he's brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. We, we do a thing. <clears throat> we do a thing at our camp sometimes um, where I announce early in the camp, maybe the second day of a five day camp or a six day camp. I announce that uh, later in the week, there's going to be, you know, four or five, depending on the number I choose, amazing speakers that are going to come and speak to you all. I mean, you never heard people as brilliant as this. And I and I, you know, I pump it up all week until the day it comes and there's five chairs on stage and I, and our students are sitting there waiting. And I just get the mic and I announce five people from the audience. <laughs> Here's yes. our speakers today, such and such. And Jonathan. Awesome. Chase. And so they got to get up there and be brilliant, you know, man. So Jonathan wasn't comfortable talking in front of people, but he did it. And not to for me to take credit, but he credits that day with teaching him what with proving to himself that he could speak in front of people. Wow. Now he's a spokesperson for autism. Jesus. That's amazing. He's written a book. He's done a TED talk. <laughs> you know? Oh man. Yeah. I mean, he's like, whoa. He's just amazing. Wow. He's just really amazing. <laughs> Love so it, you know, those people that are different. That's yes. where I head. I turn in that direction, you know, because they, if they say normal people run the world. I like crazy. Fuck yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'd rather the crazy people. Apparently I do too. <laughs> <laughs> so does my wife. <laughs> oh, my wife, definitely. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Likes the crazy. But, uh, you know, with, with what you were saying, though, Otil, I realize how lucky I am, especially to have my brothers, because through them, I learn how to attract those people. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm guessing that's the kind of people that you mean. But these people that are just standing outside of the box, you know, they'll yes. peek their head, poke their head into the box, but they're not in a box at all. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and I saw you and Kofi that way. And and it it uh, it was refreshing to know that there were other people like that other than just my brothers. Yeah, we felt the same way. I was like, because, you know, to a certain extent, I feel like an alien, like I'm on an alien planet. Like, I don't mm -hmm. feel like this is my home, you know, I, I should say I used to not feel like it. Now I do, you know, I, I just didn't want the mission that I agreed to. <laughs> it's what it was, you know, <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, now I realize that, um, it's, it's literally, it's back to that tuning up thing. Like I'm tuned into this frequency and my mother really tuned us that way. Um, and it really took with me and Kofi and so then you do, you just, it's when you're on that frequency, you're, you vibrate along, it's, you're in harmony yeah. and you just end up with each other. Thank mm -hmm. God. So really it should help us not worry. We found You know, the it. critic, we, it's a, we, yeah. we have a theme on our podcast about how to get this guy to shut up, you know, yeah. past critic. where he's yeah. being useful, you know? Yeah. And, like and, you talk uh, about the yin yang, you know, you yeah. need that critic, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, or, you know, e either shut up or change what it is saying, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because we, that voice is always going to be there. But uh, I explain that voice like the cheerleaders to the football team, right? The football team never tells the cheerleaders to shut up. Mm. Because the cheerleaders are always saying 
what they want to hear, even if they're down by 30 points. Go, go. <laughs> right. The cheerleaders aren't saying, you suck. Right? You're down by 30. Aggressive. You're never going to win. That, you know, that's not the cheer. Right. Even when they're down by 30, the cheerleaders are still talking about how great they are. So yeah, that's the voice yeah. we need. Yeah. You should have played soccer. Should have played soccer. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But imagine having that voice in our heads. Oh, man. That we would never want to quiet the mind. Victor, my, my therapist the other day, I told I called Oteil right after I talked to him. My, my therapist is the most amazing woman in the world. And she goes, listen to how you talk to yourself. Mm -hmm. She goes, would you ever let anybody talk to your wife like that? Would you ever let anybody talk to you like that? You would kick mm -hmm. their ass if they talked Qu to your wife like that. Quickly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Quickly. No questions asked. No courtesies. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> And Absolutely. that put me, that's, that has, that was the branding on my thought process yeah, that I yeah. needed was like, holy another, shit. That's amazing. another person, a good friend of mine named Remy. Remy said, cause she's down on herself all the time too. And a friend of Remy's told Remy, stop treating my, uh, stop talking to my friend like that. Yep. Nice. You know, which yeah. is kind of the same thing, but yeah. it's true. It is. It's true. But, but here, here's the thing though. In most of our lives, most of the time, people aren't talking to us the way we want them to, right? You go to study music, you're going to be told how wrong you are more yeah. than how right you are. And when you begin anything, you're going to be more wrong than right. So you hear wrong over and over. But that's the one thing about Reggie. Reggie was <sighs> never my oldest brother, Reggie, huh? who, who, who taught me and also helped O'Till with some stuff. Even to this day, he doesn't teach like that. I have never heard him tell a student they were wrong. Wow. If he's teaching a C major scale and they play a C major and they, and they play a C sharp, Reggie's like, whoa, that's the cool <laughs> note. That's the note Miles would play. You in the back of the book already. You ain't supposed to jump to the back of the book on the first day. He's like, yeah, remember that note. We're gonna come back to that note. That's that, yeah. Wow. But right now, yeah. let's you know, let's 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 come back to the front of the book. He makes you feel good. Yeah, you yeah, feel so proud. Like, mistakes were like future opportunities. But and but here's the best thing about it. He's not lying. He's not. He's not. Wow. Right. He's like, remember that. We're gonna come back to that. Right. Wow. He's not lying to you. It's yeah. the truth. Is. All right. He Kofi never was like it. that, man. I'm really lucky. You just helped me realize, man. I, I had the best teachers. I had Kofi. I had Reggie. I had Colonel Bruce. Like I never went to music school. I never went to college. Mm. And um, we, had, man. we had the best school, O'Till. We had Woo. the best. Keep going, man. Keep going. No, I mean that's it. I was just like, wow. <laughs> I had like the right. bomb because that's why I never moved to New York. You know, I used to feel guilty about admitting it, but I was like, I don't want to go up there, first of all, and go through hardship, and then on the gig, have some old guy just being mean because someone was mean to him, and that's what you're supposed to do, when yeah. <laughs> Kofi was so nice, man. Reggie was so nice about it. Now, Colonel, he was... He was <laughs> The colonel. the colonel. <laughs> the colonel for a reason. Yeah. But I yeah. knew he loved me. You know, it yeah. wasn't like some guy that on the, you're in my band now, I'm going to beat you down and either you're going to take it and survive me or I don't, like I do, he loved me. Yeah. So I could take that beating, you know, and it was a beating. It was pretty, it was boot camp. I needed a little boot, you know, you can't escape the yeah. boot camp part. No, no. But yeah, I, I don't, I look back now and I'm like, wow. You just made me, we're lucky, man. Reggie, wow, man. Remember when I got my first, this green, this base right here, my first six string that I used Modulus. on that, oh, that I remember first, that, of course. That uh, first ARU record. Of course I, I got do. It. Corner music in Nashville. <laughs> I took it yeah. straight to Reggie's house. <laughs> I'd be up till like three in the morning, and he was just so generous with his time. And, that base uh, sound good too, man. I've messed with it a lot, but I'm I'm finding stuff on it now, man. My buddy uh, Tom Gorner taught me this thing called a bebop scale. It's an extra note in the scale, and it's all based off the sixes, which 
six, which Colonel was obsessed with, right? And I'm finding all this stuff, and he showed me the scale, and I'm like, wow, when I took my bass over Reggie's house, that was the first thing he showed me. Wow. He, showed, he goes, oh, well, let me simplify it. Let me do this harmonic minor. And that's what I was practicing the day. I found all this stuff from just harmonizing the harmonic minor. And there's all these sixths everywhere. It's just patterns of six, an explosion of six. And I'm like, man, this is what Reggie showed me like the very first day that I took that bass over his house when I was wow. 26 wow. years old. Not 56. Jeez. I'm finally... It's like, let's come back to that note later, you know? Like, <laughs> right? It's like, Hang on to that, kid. <laughs> you know? Like, oh. Wow, man. It's amazing. Uh, amazing. It is amazing. It is amazing. We were lucky. And, and to have parents, too. Yeah. The parents that we had. I'm, I'm sad that I didn't know your parents that well. Of course, I met them. Likewise. We, we just had incredible, incredible parents. I feel like, uh, you know, I so, so I'm so stupid when I was young, um, but I I feel like you know I do get to know your parents and p- because I kind of know them through you guys, mm-hmm. you know, through the different facets. Although I love, that's your mom's real voice on there. Or is that a? You know, it's my mom's sister. Ah, yeah. I was sister. wondering about that because, man, yeah. I love hearing them with that North Carolina thing on it. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes, yes. I love and it. my dad, that's Kev Mo. You know, really? That's Kev okay. Mo. It's my dad in the book. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my grandfather on my mom's side, my maternal grandfather, is from North Carolina, from that Raleigh Durham era. Where you all did. the black banjo players are from. You know, that's like a, it's uh, no coincidence I'm playing, you know, that's it's a whole like another story there, man. Like salmon going back home to spawn, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Afro Billy. <laughs> it was yep. like it was meant to be, man. Wow. wow. <laughs> Jesus. And, and, and in, the, in the new book, at the beginning of every chapter, there's a female voice that reads the chapter. Like, yeah. it says, measure one or whatever. That's India Ari. Wow. Really? Yeah. No kidding. And nice. once you get further, in, you, she sings and she's the voice of music. Oh, uh, There's wow. some places in the book where music speaks, and that'll be her. Um, nice. And I, actually, I got to say this. There's one place where it's my daughter. And I had her. Try that's to who I thought it was. Yeah, because I was like, I heard. This There's one, one place where it is, Kyla, because I forgot yeah. to have India uh, say this one line. Yeah. And Kyla was home for Thanksgiving or something, so I had her try to sound as much like like India Ari. There's also India Ari reads the opening of every every chapter, and instead of calling them chapters in the book, I call them measures. So yeah. it'll say, you know, measure two. Uh, homecoming or measure three parents know best whatever but there's one chapter that for whatever reason India forgot to read she sent me every file and just skipped that one so I had my daughter do it so I'm going to have people figure out which one is is not (laughs) it was meant for her it was meant for Kyla yeah that's right. That's right. I love it man that's right And, and, and I hid I hid song titles from my records, all in every <laughs> chapter of the book, there's at least two song titles. I least. noticed that. I noticed that up front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so somewhere, somewhere down the line, I'll have some kind of contest, a, a search and find, or whatever. You know, your prizes. The jumble. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so amazing. But Otil, you can write a book. I know you can too, Mike. I don't know your whole story, but I know there's one in there. Well, you will soon. I'm working on it. Any any comedian's got a story to tell. Yeah, we this this podcast has become, uh, you know, O'Teal and I became really close friends really fast, and it was all based on like mysticism and experiences I had and he had, and we kept saying like we got to do this, we got to do this, and then the pandemic hit, and we started doing it, and it's like all the, you know, we talked about truths earlier. It's like sometimes you're like, wow, the truth was right here the whole time. I just didn't see it. You know what I mean? Because I was too busy looking uh, in a different direction. 
And now I'm kind of like really motivated and excited and I feel clearer thinking with a lot of the, you know, writing stuff. So it's, I'm excited. The crazy thing is too, like our podcasts that we do that are specifically about spirituality and heightened awareness and consciousness or whatever are the, by far the most watched. So I'm like, well, okay, guess what? That's the reason we started this anyway. Absolutely. So let's just like really focus in and then just go right for that. And as a result, since we've just had that mind tuning, like yeah. all the guests are just coming like, bam, bam, bam. It's mm-hmm. like, whoa, I got to think of somebody. And then, yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, we, I was like, wow, the spirit of music. And I saw your, uh, your Instagram thing where you did like the like four or five things on it of course like, yeah. this is perfect timing yeah to get vic on man. with this you know absolutely we're gonna Such have you to uh, to man. gonna invite you guys we do a camp called the spirit of music and and you you know you 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 gotta come you, you would be perfect just to talk about some of your experiences and kernel especially some kernel bruce bruce experiences and stuff you know, but that's, I started doing that camp because for me, music, I, I don't know that I ever really called it spiritual, but it's just what it is, you know? Um, and I used to speak freely at my camps until one day Steve Bailey found this young kid, like in a corner or sitting on a step or something, I can't remember, crying. And Steve says, you know, what's wrong? You okay? And the kid says, no, I'm not. Steve, what's wrong? The kid says, my hero, Victor Wooten, he's going to hell. Right? So I must have said something in my free speech that didn't jive with his version of religion. Yeah. I don't know what it was to this day. Maybe when you said God was her, (laughs) that that might have done it. (laughs) It's so so funny how even women get upset at that. (laughs) They should read Genesis 126, but you were saying. (laughs) But anyway, um, I started pulling back. I said, okay, let me just talk about music, you know. Yeah. And uh, but some people by by this time, there were some people that knew me and had come to a bunch of camps. They were like they were missing it. They were missing that kind of talk. So I decided, look, let's just start a camp where this that's all it's about. And we called it the spirit of music. And we, we make an agreement the first night. First thing we do after dinner, we sit down and we make an agreement that we can talk about anything. Yeah. No topic. And, but we're not going to negatively judge each other. Once the conversation's over, we're done with it. You know, um, it's, there's some conversations we're not going to record. Yeah. You know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, does everybody agree? You don't have to agree. But if you don't yeah. agree, there's some conversations you won't be a part of. But yeah. everybody agrees. And O'Till, we get into some Ooh. crazy stuff, O'Till. When we, I mean, if the power of music is powerful. And I mean, having students play a piece of music with someone in mind, Mm -hmm. and then that person will stand up, Mm. you know, Wow. and, and, and you're there to watch it. My wife's there to watch it, you know, and I mean, crazy, crazy fun stuff. Just through music. And the idea being that we know that our music is touching you. It's a vibration. You feel it. But it's not just touching the ears. Right? No, it starts My music's out. not doing this. You can hear it's 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 like this. But science can now kind of tell you that your thoughts are doing the same thing. You know, like a woman just told me just two days ago. This woman that uses music, she she tunes your biofield. This guy, this woman named Eileen McCusick, she uses tuning forks, and from wherever she is, she hits that tuning fork, and she just starts telling you about yourself. 
You know, and she says she tunes your body for crazy stuff, just wow. the way I like it, right? <laughs> so, but she 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 said to me, and, and she said it in a way I never said it, but I say the same thing. She said, science, when they put these EKGs or whatever on your brain and they can like measure your thoughts, she said, those thoughts don't stop at the scalp, yeah. right? They out there. So science, there's been enough experiments to let you know that you can touch someone with a thought. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we don't need proof to know that <laughs> I'm touching you with music. Right. But if I'm touching you with music and a thought, what would happen if I put the two together? Wow. Can it become yeah. more powerful? And the answer is yes. And that's, what we ex that's one of the things we explore at the Spirit of Music Camp, and it's powerful. It's the oh. truth. I, I had a 15-year debate with Butch Trucks, the drummer of the Almond Brothers, about this stuff. And he was like, my dad, I don't believe in anything mystical, right? And I was like, but you're a millionaire because of something <laughs> that science can't quantify whatsoever. Like, what is singing? <laughs> you know, like, why is it mean more or less at sometimes, like, you know, but he was really hurt by religion, just like my dad was, you know? Yeah. And then I was, I asked my dad, I was like, dad, so you don't believe in anything mystical, but what about mom? And he goes, well, all I know is people shouldn't mess with your mother. <laughs> I was like, well, you know, like, you don't get to have it both ways, man. Right. Like, what do you say? Right. You know, do you yeah. listen to yourself? Yeah. You know yeah, what's yeah. funny about him too, man? His oh, he was raised what I called Nazi Catholic, like the pre Vatican II Catholic, you know. Not to slam any Catholics out there, because all my favorite books, you know, are Catholic or Catholic writers, my theology book Christian theology books. So I was like, you know, I'm getting deep deep into it with my dad because I've had this crazy metaphysical experience that saved my life, you know. And I said, Dad, what's your favorite book? And he goes, Oh, this book called The Screw Tape Letters. Right? And I was like, The Screw Tape Letters is a C.S. Lewis book. Like one of the most famous Christian theologians of all time. And so I'm like, why? He goes, well, it's just, uh, you know, it's just dead on about human nature. All the pe ways that people try to weasel out or be dishonest with themselves or someone else, you know, and I was just like, wow, you know, that's the complexity of being human and hurt. And like, you know, his favorite book is about the devil. You know? And the devil is just like, I got your number. I got your number. I got your number. He said it was just masterful. But, and I was just like, okay, dad, I, I give up. You yeah, know, everybody yeah. is supposed to be on different parts of the spectrum. But he could, I was like, mm -hmm. I know, you know, I know, you know, not on the intellectual level, but that heart, that spiritual level, because that's why you got with mom. Yeah, yeah, you got to be tuned to balance something you to out. Find. Yeah, that's it. That's yep. it. And that's, all my friends, all my male friends, I'm noticing this pattern that are like atheistic ish. Their wives are like totally like this one sees ghosts, this one has crazy like stuff happen to them, like happens to me or Colonel, Br you know, and I'm just like, oh, you guys are bad. And you're choosing your wives with that spiritual part of yourself. So it's right. all fine. <laughs> it's the <laughs> balance. Know? Yeah. Right. I'm not going to try to use my intellect to explain to your intellect. Like, you know. No. <laughs> Dude, that's so awesome. That's so incredible. <laughs> Victor, I mean, like the whole time you're talking about that, like, you know, touching someone with a thought and mm -hmm. with music, it's all about intent. And it's all about like, that's what makes art art. And that's what makes fans come back for more. And that's what makes tears stream down your face. When you see your favorite musician play with, with more than just, I got to go back to the hotel and my food's going to be cold and whatever yeah. else. Like it's intent. They want the love that man. Sure. It's all about intent. It's all I, about I, I intent. Agree. I agree. I, I play better that. like that uh, because 
I got to go back to the hotel. And the, somebody asked me, how do you have such a good time all the time? I said, I go through so much shit to get here that I do not want to do. So I'll be damned if I'm yeah. not going to have the time of my life when I get Like, if I'm not having a good time, you know, I got a bad headache or something real right. bad's happening. Because otherwise, I well, mean to have a good time. Yeah, Absolutely. well, it's like work is the part when you're off stage. Yeah, you know what I mean? Airports. Yeah. You know, acclimating yeah. to a new air conditioner or whatever in a hotel. Oh, yeah. Like the fun part is <laughs> the performing, the intention. Yeah. It's the only place where everybody, thousands upon thousands of people are there to cheer you on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about it. You know, <laughs> that's why they're there. They, they came to agree with you. <laughs> I'd say my critic is sitting there going, you know, they expect you to be the best, you know, how you were on your best night ever, the nights that made you the legend, you know, but you know, you're not that every night, you know, <laughs> you know, you don't feel like right. that at all tonight, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, but you got like thousands of people, how, even if it's 50, they came here to cheer you on, you know? It's Absolutely. That's thing. why they're there. And those that don't want to cheer you on aren't there. <laughs> there it's not go. like sports where half of them are against you. <laughs> you know? right. I mean, seriously. But that's the power of art. Yes. You can become a Michael Jordan or Pele or whatever, that even though I'm not rooting for your team, right? I still yeah. want to see Michael Jordan play, LeBron James play. We're still yeah, cheering yeah. for you because that's what art does. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You don't have to understand that. You know, like my brother Roy said, Tiger Woods had me watching golf. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't yeah, know nothing totally, about no, I don't even like golf. <laughs> yeah. But this dude has raised the level so high, I got to watch it. Yeah. That's I used to wonder, like, how do racists watch ball games? You know, like, <laughs> but it's probably that same thing. They're like, shit, Michael Jordan's Michael Jordan. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, like, exactly. you know? yeah. <laughs> whatever. Exactly. It's you know? so funny too. Like when you're when you're up there and you're performing. I think I, I don't know if I ever told you about this until when we did the Minnesota State Fair, and there was like about I don't know six thousand people there or whatever, and it was like an outdoor stage and there was everyone so excited and having such a great time and, and there's one guy like three rows back sitting back like this <laughs> arms crossed hating that he's there his wife is a huge fan and she's like all excited i open up for on the road for a tv show that does stand that does a live show as well victor mm -hmm. and i got to do these giant rooms opening for these guys and i'm out there to open up for them and it's just like people are, they get brought, I get brought out to an announcer going, you guys ready to see the Impractical Jokers? And everybody goes nuts. And they go, but first, we've got this guy. <laughs> and they're like, asshole. oh, what the fuck, right? Like they know they're mad already. And I go out, make a joke about that. But everyone's having a good time. My jokes are doing okay. It's a giant crowd. And I see the one guy that's not having a good time, three rows in the front, and that everyone else just disappears. Oh. Suddenly my critic puts a spotlight fucking right on that guy's face. And every joke I'm putting 110% into just making him crack up just a little bit, yeah. just a little bit. The rest of the crowd could be going bananas. And if I don't get them and I walk off, the guys go, what's the crowd like? And I'm like, crowd sucks tonight. I'm like, you guys are going to really have to fucking bring it. <laughs> but, if, but if I break that guy, I'm like, you guys are going to have a blast. It's fucking incredible. You know, it's just so That's funny. Cool. It's, it's funny because I'm the exact opposite. Like I remember playing clubs and there was hardly anybody there. But I'd see one body like moving, like somebody was getting off. Maybe yeah. they're in the shadows. But I would just play to that person the whole night. It's all I needed. Right. It was one. And they were just like, and then it, it usually would spread, you know, just yeah. like a, you could amplify that vibration, right. you know. Yeah. Absolutely. But Vic, I know we've had you on a long time, but one thing I want to talk to uh, ask you about that has been really meaningful to me that I heard, I'm not very far through the book. I think I'm in. The chapter, like artistic, I'm really... Artism, yeah. But you said something early on in the book about, you know, you don't finish the cycle until you teach. Mm. And mm. I have found um, 
at this, you know, in my fifties, like teaching is just <laughs> like, I just love it so much, man. And I, I want to do it more and more and I am doing it more and more. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you've been doing your camps now for how many, like 20, 21, 20, 21 this, years. Uh, yeah. yeah this 20. will be this. If we do camps online this year, this will make the 22nd year. Wow. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that, how you have arrived at that. Like it's not finished till you like pay it for sure. it or whatever. Well, I mean, I, I, I arrived at that concept by doing it. You know, um, when I started teaching, I got so much better. Yeah. Because when I started being asked to teach, I was like, I'm not a teacher. I never taught anything. I don't know how to teach, you know, but the Flectone started rising in popularity and I was in Bass Player Magazine a lot. So I started getting asked to do clinics and things like that. So I really looked into what people were teaching. I looked at videos and the books I could find. And and that was when I found out that people were really just teaching notes for the most part. That was my take on it. They called it music theory, but it was all about 12 notes. It was good stuff. But if I can buy the 12 notes, right. there's got to be more than that. You know, every bass you buy got the same notes as my heroes, but I can never sound like my heroes. So what, what, is, what am I missing? I got the notes. And so I started trying to figure out how to teach that, the other stuff. Let the people who can teach the notes better than me teach those. Let me teach the other stuff. And O'Till, I learned so much. I learned so much about what I already knew, but it really made me learn a whole lot more. And I went, whoa, this is where the learning is. It isn't teaching it. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people, don't wait. Don't wait until you think you're good enough. There's always someone who doesn't know what you know. Teach that. Yeah. And, and, but I just found out that through teaching, I enter into a whole nother world of knowledge. If I enter into the teaching world, honestly, if I enter into that world, as I know it all, you're an empty vessel, I have to fill you with my knowledge and, you know, then shut off. I'm just teaching what I do know and I don't get anything new. But man, O'Till, you know, and this is this is not to say I'm a good teacher or to brag, but, you know, I, I, I usually I don't have any students, even at Berkeley, that I know I'm going to have them next week and then the next week. So I, I rarely ever have to come up with a curriculum. Yeah, I teach a spur of the moment <laughs> like this conversation. We just making it yeah. up. I may have a few questions. You may have a few, questions, but we're making it up and, and it works every time. I teach that way. I can't have a curriculum if I don't know what, if I don't know the student in my classes, I never, like my workshops, I don't know who's coming. So how do I know what I'm teaching today if I don't know who's coming? So I have ideas, but then we talk and every time, not 99%, 100% of the time, the student tells me without knowing it, what they need to learn. And even when I don't know how to teach that because I'm open and I want, I, I love the students so much and I'm not teaching for my benefit to show how good I am. I want the student to realize how good they are. What I need to teach comes through. And in many cases, this doesn't feel like teaching at all. That's why in the book I say, you don't teach, right? You know, you're just showing, you're showing the student how to do it. They yeah. got to teach themselves. You can't plan it like the matrix in their head. And if they don't get it, then you show them again, or then you show them a different way. But I can show you a scale. I can't teach it to you. We call it teaching yeah. and I get that, but I'm really just showing you. But I realize that if I can show the student like Reggie does, if I can show the student a version of themselves that they can fall in love with. Mm. Wow. They will learn so quickly, huh. right? And at that point, you get to the place where you can back away, you know, mm-hmm. and they're off, you know? And I get the feeling that's what Colonel Bruce did. That's what I was just thinking, man. You know, he got you guys, 
you know, to this place, and 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 he's somewhere, just like a like a teacher, just smiling, like Reggie does. People yeah. know my name. They think I came up with all this stuff, spinning the bass. Now nah, Reggie just sitting in his room, smiling. Yeah. Right. Anything you like that I do, credit Reggie. He told <laughs> me what time he said. He goes, you know, I used to lie to him all the time. I said, but you want to be a superhero? Yeah. He said, you could do all that. You could fly. You could, but you got to practice. You can't just go jump off the roof. He said, so I would tell him that you could do things that I wasn't, I didn't even have to be sure they could do it, but because they didn't have any barriers to belief that they could, they would do it. He's the oldest of all of them, you know, yes. <laughs> I was just like, just like, <laughs> just so... I was but, like, but, what but, a great uh, gift, man. Think, think about that as a kid, though. It, you know, we're, we're Reggie, Roy, and Rudy, they used to practice jump, dive, dive, roll. They dive and roll over garbage cans when they were little kids. Wow. Right? Because the idea was if they can dive over garbage cans and get comfortable, that as they grow, they're going to start diving over bushes. And by the time they're teenagers, they're going to be diving over houses. <laughs> and by the time they're out. adults, by the time they're adults, they'll be able to fly. <laughs> wow. So that's their mentality. Our parents don't never say, no, you, that, you, you're silly. No, parents never say that. Jesus. So when, when I was, this is the story I hear, when, when I was being born, because they all had super, superhero names. Reggie was the Flash. I forget who Roy was. <laughs> <laughs> but they wanted to name me Superboy from what they called, from what they told me, Superboy. And when really? mom and they were looking for names, right? <laughs> so that was their mentality as kids. We're going to grow up and be superheroes. Wow. Right? And they were that's never amazing. told, no, that's that's silly. Yep. And they all did it in their own way. <laughs> they sure did. You know, we, Roy, we saw the five of y'all play when we were, I was 19 and Kofi was 21. And we were like, what on earth is happening right now? <laughs> like, it's hard to process all of it at, at the same time. Because you can focus on any one brother and your mind would start to bleed out your ears. <laughs> and then all of it together, you'd just be like... What is going on here? You yeah. know, it's Rudy like, wow. playing two saxes, Rudy. Dude. Oh, Till, check this out, Mike. You got to yeah. hear this story. Do you guys remember the show Don Kirshner's rock concert? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, in that, whatever that was, 77, 78 or whatever, mm -hmm. Don Kirshner sent two, two of his people to our house in Virginia. And it was just one of the many stories where someone was going to discover the Wooten brothers. Well, last year, maybe year before last, but within the last two years, I get a message on Facebook. This guy says, my name is such and such. I used to work for Don Kirshner. He wow. sent me and my partner to your house. I still wow. have the cassette tape demo that your <laughs> mom gave to me. What? Wow. And I went, ooh, I got to be nice to this guy. Right? <laughs> I got to get my hands on this. <laughs> we had done a demo way back that none of us had a copy of. Wow. Oh, my I God. I got it. Yes. Really? Oh, I want to hear Till, that. Until one of these days you're going to, oh, Rudy. Dude. Two saxophones. My brother Rudy, he passed away way too young. I'm 56. I think he was 52. He's, he, yeah. Rudy's six years older than me. And he passed away at 52. So whatever, whatever that adds up to, that's how long ago. He was our horn section. Otil is killing. <laughs> it is, man, I forgot about these songs that we wrote. All how, instrumental. How old were you guys when that, when that, uh, when that demo got made, you think? Um, I had just gotten my Alembic. So this is a pre Federa, pre Federa. Oh yeah, yeah definitely pre Federa. Yeah. So it let's say it was seventy seven. That means I'm in seventh grade. That means wow. I'm about 12, 11 or yeah. twelve. Wow. Yeah. 
yeah oh, it's got to be such a trip to oh. hear man so if i was 12 that meant reggie was 20 because it was norfolk state days when he went to norfolk state where he met kelly gravely and yeah and uh cat dyson and all those people O'Till is so good is that uh, where hey. consuela moorhead was teaching absolutely john yeah. shacklett yeah yeah consuela man yeah did you ever meet shacklett john shacklett i'm i don't think so okay now so consuela lee moorhead she is the the film producer uh director spike lee consuela lee was his aunt yeah so wow. spike lee's dad was bill lee great yeah. Jazz yeah. basses with Bill Lee's sisters, Consuela. And she was teaching in Virginia for a few years. Dude. She taught at Hampton Institute, which is now Hampton University. Hampton University. Yeah, pianist. Um, and then she switched to Norfolk State. So my brothers went to Hampton for one year, then switched to Norfolk State. But Consuela brought in a guy named John Shacklett, who grew up. He's a guitarist, a left-handed guitarist, and he grew up with uh, Wes Montgomery. Mm. Wow. So Consuela brought uh, Shacklett to and Norfolk And that's State. where Reggie, oh. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yes. Oh. So Reggie, you know, you know yeah. Reggie was in the McLaughlin at the yeah. time, you know, Al Demiola, fusion, playing yeah. fast. And he said one day Shacklett said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's hip, that's hip. He said, yeah, but when we was young, uh, uh, Wes used to play that fast, but every note was a chord. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's when Reggie learned from Shacklett how to how to take them chord jazz solos. You know, where wow. Reggie was just playing single notes, but then John Shacklett showed him how to. And John Shacklett's still alive; he lives up near Seattle. Really, but he's hip. But but uh, apparent according to my brother Shacklett and and Consuela. They say they got fired. I don't know if they quit, but Reggie Reggie always said they were just too good. That I hear they, that a lot. They, they got they got let go, and so wow. with our parents' blessing, Reggie Roy and Rudy dropped out of school, out of college, and that was when I realized what I don't have to go to college. Sweet, really? <laughs> you know, I can I can literally play music the rest of my life. Cause I never realized that I just played music. I thought I was right. going to be something else, you know, sure, fireman sure. or something, you know? Right. <laughs> That's too funny, man. Cause like when I, when I got the six string, that's why I went to Reggie's house. I was like, I want to learn chord melody. Cause I would sing the single note stuff while I was playing, but I wanted to put chords underneath and then be able to change the chords underneath what I was doing, he just helped me unlock all that. Wow, well, you're and, uh, sure doing it, man. Wow. And I, and, but I didn't know about the connection between him and Shacklett and that he was like Wes Montgomery's friend. And like, it's oh, like, yeah. oh, perfect. Yeah. I couldn't have went to a better source. Absolutely. Oh, and jo <laughs> Joseph took a few lessons, you know. So during that time, if I'm, let's say I'm 10, Joseph's 13, you know. Um, 77 78 or whatever so <laughs> joseph says he takes a, a lesson from consuela lee moorhead who's just the most hip amazing yeah. pianist so joseph says consuela says well, okay well let, let me let me see you play uh let me hear you play a you know whatever a d7 chord you know so joseph gets on there and plays his chord and she says all right that, that's good that's good she says but you know you got 10 fingers and, and, and you're playing that chord, and, and three of your notes are D's. You know? <laughs> and he, and he said that was the first time he realized, yeah, I don't have to play D's all, all the time. And then she got him, him into voicings. You know, and if wow. you got a bass player, you don't even need to play a D, you know? Yeah, that's right. But she was hip. And so wow. we're very lucky that our brothers got into the real people. Yeah. At, a, at a young age. And so, you know, us, we were younger. Yeah. So we got the benefit of that, of Shacklett and, and, and Consuela, Lee Moorhead, you know, and there's a few other people out there that were around at that time, too, that are out there. I don't know if you guys, you know, Kat Dyson. We had her, we on, had the her on the podcast. Okay. Well, Kat yeah. was at there at the same time. Yeah. You yeah. know, and there's some other, other people. 
And then, you know, like you and me and Steve Wilson and James Genus, you know, we were the young yeah. folks benefiting, you know. Keith Horn. Keith Horn, John Billings, Scotty Miss You. Yeah. Yep. Man. Yeah. What a I time, t- man. That was the thing with Kofi, too, man. I was like, I, I said, you know, I would go play with these other people. And you read the same chord, be like a F major seven chord. But Kofi's major seven chords sound a lot different. You know, <laughs> Kofi sound like Herbie or George Duke. Right. So I don't know, Jan Hammer, check just the voicings. And I was like, there's some magic. I know this is simple math, but what mm. is this feeling? What are these feelings I'm getting <laughs> yeah. from Speak yeah. Like a Child, from Herbie, Herbie's record, Speak, it's the voicings. Yeah. And Jocko had that same thing, like his choice of, you know, and that's I, was, I was like, I just got to understand these voicings better and get what I can. Now I'm like really into the piano. Like we have an acoustic piano. Kofi begged me to play piano for so long, but I wanted to find it on the bass. You know, there's mm-hmm. certain things you can't do. You know, your major and minor seconds are so far apart. And on the piano, they're super close. So mm-hmm. I'm like on the piano, I'm like, oh, I could do that. And every time I experiment and find something else, I'm like, ah, that's what I remember Kofi doing that. Or, you know, it's like yeah. We, yeah. we're so lucky to have those cats, man. So Jesus. lucky. So well, I want to keep you, man. I mean, I've, I've you've been on a super long time, <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm home, man. I'm home. <laughs> back. Will you come back on, Victor? I mean, this I is would, I would love to, Mike. I, just anytime. to listen to you guys is is such is really really such an honor, and and I've I've stood in awe in the crowd watching you. You know, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and many times, you know. Uh, and and it's just truly an honor to get to know you and uh, hear you got like this well, podcast has brought us a lot of unbelievable people but I believe it this is very stre- this is very special this is I got to say very say one thing too before we go <laughs> that uh, when we went to Japan together yeah. Yeah. so Vic calls me he goes man I want you to come do a tour of Japan with me it's just going to be me and my drummer Tariko Watson is just a monster and you and that's it. And I was like, oh <laughs> really? He's like, yeah, man. We'll just... And so <laughs> we go over there and Vic <laughs> we play and Vic could take a solo and just like peel the paint off the walls. You know, people's eyeballs popped out of their head. And then it was like my turn to go. <laughs> and I remember like <laughs> after one or two nights of that, I was like, can I go first? When we just <laughs> oh, no. you know, but the thing it taught me, though, was it, you know, it really, um, it was so good for me because it put me so on the spot with my critic and all that. And I ended up reverting to what Colonel Bruce taught me. He's like, what's the thing that you have to offer people that they can't get anywhere else? It's you. Mm-hmm. And it just, mm-hmm. it, I just had to remember, hey, man, just go do your thing. Right. And Vic was like, yeah, that's why. I asked you to come here, you know, like to do that, like just do yeah. that. That's incredible. And man, that Yokohama, was that the night? I, there was I, a I, one I, night was just like, yeah. I think it was. But man, oh, till your thing is so strong. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's this so strong. This is what, you know, I, I was spending, I was in four guitar classes today. Um, where I'm a guest instructor and one of them's called guitar mini, you know, and the other one's yeah. jazz funk, f- whatever. And these musicians, the guitar players are good. They're playing all the right notes, but you know, one guy said, you, you know, I hope I don't sound offensive, but you sound, you play great. You got the notes, right? I give you an A. I said, but your emotion, I'm not going to walk out of here. remembering your solo, your notes. I'm going to remember what it felt like. And emotionally, yeah. I can fit it in a shoebox and put it in the back of my closet. Yeah. You know, I said, and, and here's what I did. Until I said, okay, and I asked the teacher, can I try something with him? And he said, sure. So I said, okay, you get an A for playing the guitar. You already passed that test, so let that go. I said, I want you to take another solo over the same tune. But I want to hear how bad you can sound. 
<laughs> That's what Bruce used to do. Yeah. I remember talking. You said Bruce would do the same thing. I want to just hear you take the worst solo ever. <laughs> and you know the story, O'Till. It was unbelievable. He sounded like a young, like uh, uh, John McLaughlin in the early wow. days. Playing fast and hard. Just all over the place. And I watched through these Zoom windows, the other <laughs> classmates there. <laughs> Right. And the kid is smiling. I said, don't, you know, don't forget you playing jazz. You ain't supposed to smile. You know? <laughs> Stay you know? classical. <laughs> and so, but then he's done. And I asked, and, and in many cases, they think they're sounding bad, but the rest of the people are like, wow. But it's, it's not so that it's so good. It's like all of a sudden you're coming, he's coming through. It's real. Wow. It's real. And you feel yeah. it. Yeah. And you feel it. You know, and, and but O'Till, you, I mean, you know this, you know, we all have our critic and I, you know, I'm dealing with focal dystonia right now. So it's hard for me to even to even play a note. So yeah. my critic is loud right now. It's like life is forcing me to live all the stuff I've been teaching. Mm. But your thing is so you. I mean, still nobody is doing that on the base. You know, it's the same thing for me with, you know. Uh, my my good friend Steve Bailey, who he and I are like a yin yang symbol, opposites, right? I mean, we play opposite. We, you know, when I met him, he was living in L.A. leather motorcycles, <laughs> you know, and I won't even look at a motorcycle, you know, just op yeah. but we've hit it off for some reason. But a part of it is when he plays, you don't sound like nobody else. Like it or not, nobody. <laughs> Bob Dylan, can he really sing? Right. Who cares? There's only one Bob Dylan. I like it, <laughs> you know. And O'Till has that at a high level, and you know it, Mike, at yeah. a high level. And he had it way back in the whatever it was, 70s or 80s, or whenever it was, 80s, 80s high level. Yeah. Both of them guys, both of them Burbages, and. When you have it, and this sounds egotistical, when you have it, you recognize it. But it doesn't mean you recognize it in yourself. Yeah. Yes. But if you don't have it in yourself, you can't recognize it in anyone else. It's, oh, so man. you guys helped me see me. Wow. Right? And I wanted to be close to that. Right. Right. We didn't get to, you know, we knew each other as kids. We didn't get to spend a whole lot of time. Yeah. You know, but no, now we we're busy. We're traveling. You know, let's do something together. Right. Let's yeah. go to Japan. Let's get out the country. Yeah. Let's go to a place where we're tall people. We're tall, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But the two towering bass players from America. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, uh, but, but you know, I'm joking. I'm joking, but I'm totally serious. Yeah, yeah for real. The, the the other thing too is that I'm so proud of the people I grew up with that are yeah. doing it. Me too, man. James Genus out there with yeah. Herbie. I remember when he got the yeah. Brecker Brother gig. I was so happy. Yeah, man. I mean, there's zero jealousy. I mean, right. none. Not yeah. even, not even a, a a hint. Just pure happiness, and it's always been that way. When James, yeah. I heard James Genus, there was no way, no reason for me to be jealous because I had my brothers. Yeah. That's who I was going to be growing up playing with. I didn't want to play with the Brecker brothers. Right, play with my brothers. That right? was so me was too. No, yeah, there was no need to be jealous. <laughs> right, Steve Wilson playing with Chick Corea or whoever. Billy Drummond, now he left the neighborhood. He's in New York, right? Playing with everybody. You know, that made, you know, just so, so proud of that. Yeah. And then seeing, you know, O'Till and Colonel Bruce, and I still got that first record. Seeing that happen, man, I'm just so happy. You know? And uh, so that tour was as was a lot for me. You know, I want, I, 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 my heroes, I want to be around. Right. You 100%. know, because I recognize, I learned more about me because I, I learned as a young kid that what I see is me. 
And, you know, to say you met uh, Sifu Brian Edwards, Kung Fu guy. Oh, dude, we had a crazy mystical experience together. Yeah. Yeah. So Sifu, this is a Kung Fu guy. Best I've ever met. His teacher was classmates with Bruce Lee. Wow. With the famous man they made movies about. Now, one of them, I can't remember if Duncan got Bruce Lee into uh, Wing Chun or, or or Bruce Lee got Duncan into. I can't remember, but one of them got the other. But when I first met Brian, egotistical, just looking for a fight, I didn't want to be his friend, but I wanted to be close to him. <laughs> he had something I had wanted, and you get it by being close to them. So, it, you know, I studied with him. Every class, he needed a demonst- he needed a volunteer, me, you know. But it's the same way musical, you know, except that, you know, I, O'Till was, was definitely a person that I liked, and I knew I wasn't going to die if I got close to him. You know, with seafood. <laughs> like seafood. Right, you never know, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I say that in all honesty. <laughs> you know, I, I, I took every opportunity uh, I could get to play with you. Didn't we do one of those base days or something? 97. Together? Yeah. 97. Yeah, yeah, the day the bass players took over the world. Right. I learned a lot about myself that tour too, man. I'm gonna tell you that really, uh, it really freed me. It really freed me, uh, and I was pretty damn free, man. I had many years with the Colonel at that point, you know. By that point, but it's just good, you know. There's always this. Uh, it, it it just really showed me. Yeah. It taught me more about myself, and I, I've. You have that video somewhere. <laughs> somewhere I do. And, I still and, and, haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been cleaning up my house, and I found a box. I found I found a box and a bag of old eight millimeter uh, videos and things, and I yeah. just got to go through them and yeah. see what's on them. All in its time. I could tell Mike's got to pee really bad. Just no, for... you <laughs> just thinking about that bag of videos. There's some gold in there, man. Yeah. Well, dude, we'll let you go, man. Uh, Vic, I, I love you, man. This is so great to, uh, to look yes. at this. Steve Bailey's text in, and I'm getting Daryl Jones, John Patitucci, Will Lee, Leland Sklar. Wow. If I could talk to my 15-year-old self... <laughs> <laughs> See that collection of names coming up on this Star Trek communicator. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, amazing, man. Right? No, nah, man. Star Trek had flip phones. They old school. <laughs> right? They're old school. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Those are antiques now. <laughs> yeah. That only had unlimited nights and weekends. <laughs> Hey, call the Klingons. Oh, no, I'm out of minutes. <laughs> Beat me up, Scotty. I'll call oh, my signal's bad. <laughs> only got two bars. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Ah, oh, dude, yeah. this is incredible. Thank you so oh. much, man. Yeah, bless you, brother. Bless you, you man. I'm, I'm down okay. for that spirit of music camp. Eric. Call me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we'll probably do it online this year. Uh, everything will yeah. probably be online, but I'll let you know. Please do, awesome, man. Dude. Thank you, know. you. If I could come be a fly on the wall, I would love Please to. Please do. Please do. It's just going to be a Zoom link. Awesome. And once you know the name and the password, you're in. Thanks, man. <laughs> he plays guitar. Well, I'm playing. I'm a lefty, too. Well, there yeah. we go. Yeah, come on. I'll do it for sure. And the left, that, I don't know that I've ever met a, a, a musician that played left-handed that wasn't good. There's something about that. <laughs> it's like left-handed yeah. people and blind people. Yeah. yeah. You know what's weird know. is uh, me, I'm left-handed. My wife, Jess, is left-handed. Nigel's left-handed. And our adopted daughter, Kavi, is left-handed. <laughs> I was like, okay, now this is getting weird. Wow. She, she came all the way from India. <laughs> you know, it's like all right. of us are lefties. Wow. I, I just thought that was cool. That is I got, cool. I remember that I got cool. I got my first guitar and picked it up and was like, "Oh, they made it wrong. It's upside down." <laughs> like I blame the guitar, not me. You know, and then I'm like, "And you were right." Yeah, exactly. Well, here's the thing: if you stare at Hendrix if, pictures, I'm like, "Oh, it's upside down." Yeah, you know. If you give a guitar to any young kid, they're going to hold it left-handed. If they if they've seen a person play, uh, because. Yeah. 
The exactly. motion hand is this one. Mm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So like a piano, to me, there shouldn't be a right or left-handed way to do it. Right. Yeah. Right? What we call regular way is backwards to me. You know, it's like my right hand is the one that you see doing all the motion. All the work. Totally. Totally. So that, to me, makes the most sense. But for some reason. I used to think that because the lowest note was the furthest from my, like, my heart. This is as a little kid, I was think this. The lowest E note that you could play was the furthest away, and the highest note was the closest. And that made sense to me mathematically or dyslexically or mm. whatever, that, like, you should be climbing up. Do you know what I mean? Like, so when it's, when it's, when you pick up a guitar and you're holding it upside down, I thought, oh, this is perfectly the way it should be. Wow. You know, the furthest, <laughs> deepest sound is the furthest from you and the highest is the closest. But then I had to unlearn all that shit. It's logical to me. Makes sense. <laughs> are, are you left, are you really left-handed? Yes. I, I write left-handed. I play guitar left-handed. I have to like drive left hand anything, you know, um, but I do play sports. I'm righty. So like I bat lefty, I, I bat righty, I throw righty, I, you know, but I can't, I, I cannot hold a pick. I do not know how to hold a pick in my right hand. I just can't do it. Wow. That's interesting. It's so strange. Yeah. It is but strange. if I throw with my left, I'm like, you know, it, it goes too far. I know. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> the same thing, dude. <laughs> can't wait wow. to have you back, dude. This is so incredible. Anytime. This is awesome. You know how to reach me. And I might even remember the first time this time. <laughs> we, we, it's all good. tell the audience that I missed the first one because I just forgot. It's all right. Oh, you know what? I, I got to share this last story. That, that, anyone who knows me and my brothers know, we always say like, oh, just one more thing. And 30 <laughs> minutes later. This is a true story, though. I'm laying in bed. I've been trying to learn Spanish, so I make sure I get my Duolingo lesson in. I'm doing that too, Duolingo. Yeah. So, um, and I had to get it in before midnight, you know, so I can keep my streak going. Nice. So it's after midnight now, and I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute. Was today Tuesday? <laughs> Am I supposed to do that podcast? <laughs> I look at my calendar. My calendar says Tuesday. And I, my heart went, oh, no. <laughs> and literally, I literally was like sulking in bed. Oh, man. And I'm looking at the clock. It's too late to call Otil. It's too late to text. He's on the East Coast. I went to bed feeling bad. And then it wasn't until I woke I woke up early. My wife's out of town. She usually gets up with the kids, make sure they drive to school to, fine. I got up early and I happened to look at my calendar again and it still said Tuesday. <laughs> and I'm like, is this right? I hit the thing that puts it on today, you know, and it stayed on Tuesday. And I asked my kid, what is today? Wednesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. And I was like, Thank you, God. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't miss it. <laughs> you definitely I didn't, didn't miss it. That's man. a true story, man. I you set an alarm. I mean, I'm not missing tonight. So I text O'Till late. We still on? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. But I went to oh, bed dear. with a heavy heart, man. I did. Uh, I thought I had missed it. It's well, all I right. Tonight, I hope tonight you can go to bed with a light heart. Because Absolutely. I got to go get my Spanish in, though. Yeah, yes. you better hurry. You only you, got 10 minutes. That's no, right. No, I got an hour and 10 minutes. Oh, that's right. Oh, He's on right. Tennessee time. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, Bless you, man. Yes. Vamanos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks, thanks a lot, you all. I appreciate it. I really do. Yeah. Thank Love you, man. Love you, too. Love you, too. Awesome. Love you too.